internationally known business expert Carol Sanford has a new book. It's called The Regenerative Business, Redesign Work, Cultivate Human Potential, and Achieve Extraordinary Outcomes, and Carol is with us to talk about it. Hi, Carol. Hi, Stan. Good to see you again. This book is fantastic, absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic. But what is regenerative business? You know, the funny thing is it's becoming a really popular term and it, no one's really going back and looking at it and seeing what it means. They think of it as to restore or bring something back to something. But regenerate literally means take something back to its DNA and allow that DNA to flourish more. So when a starfish regrows, a, um, a, they aren't called legs, but whatever they are, it's actually going back to its own DNA, but it's currently in time and it regenerates itself to be able to function and it's better than the fish was before. That's what regeneration means. So does that mean that a lot of businesses are broken? It means a lot of businesses are kind of flat, that they're living out of trends and they're living out of research and they aren't looking at who they are. And the only way a business can really be non-displaceable and its people is to be itself. But it takes a while to discover that, to reveal who it really is and live that authentically. And that's what regeneration is about. Mm -hmm. Just for people who don't know, and I can't imagine there would be anybody who doesn't, mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, talk about you just a little bit. You're, sure. Uh, I, I called you an internationally known business expert and indeed you are. You travel the world giving talks about business. The international part is true. As I said to you before, I don't believe in experts. I believe, all, I believe that I do create great and useful things, I have a great track record, but I don't actually think of me as an expert or else I don't get to keep learning. But what I do is work as a business educator and I think on my website it says regenerative business education. And it's teaching people how to have everything they do in a business from strategy to leadership to work design to culture all come out of this regenerative paradigm and taking it back to its DNA. That's my work and I've written lots of books about it. I teach in several universities about it. I run summits. I give talks and so that's kind of who I am. We'll be getting your website up, carolsanford.com, up on the screen several times throughout the show. Um, so this book, The Regenerative Business, why write this book? There were a couple of things that were driving me crazy. Uh, suddenly there's a popular idea about flattening the organizations, getting rid of hierarchies. And it's not that I'm opposed to that because I've actually built them from the ground up. But what it, they were not good ideas. They were things I tried when I was a kid in this work. They were not good for the human beings. I mean, they made themselves be less bossed around, but it didn't really give them a way to grow. They were not good for business because they become working on what already existed, working on existence, I call it. So they weren't good for business. And the third thing was they did not build what we need for democracy to work. So this book includes what's great for human beings to fulfill all their potential, what's great for a business in order to be able to get the kind of financial returns it needs, and it makes things work so that every human being in it is a good citizen. I mean, a great citizen, and it improves the way democracy works. The last chapter in the book comes back to why we do this for democracy to work. Are companies supposed to be democratic? No, not the company. I'm not talking about making the company democratic. Although, if you think about what democracy means, where everybody gets to participate, yes. But uh, I, because I redesigned so many things that don't have hierarchical process, we don't get rid of supervisors. But what we do is change the roles everyone has so that everyone is contributing. So what I'm talking about is the way you structure work works in a way that makes democracy work. So, for example, um, if you think about the biggest problem I think we have in democracy right now is people have quit thinking for themselves. I mean, we see our Congress who votes because the party says you should vote that way. Mm -hmm. You don't question. And also people become reactive and frightened and they're easily triggered. Well, that's a matter of personal development. So this combination of critical thinking skills and personal development, I mean, we know that's needed for business, but yeah. it's also needed for democracy. So if you have a business that's not optimum, you're one of the ones that's not contributing to a working democracy. But generally, though, you're not a commentator about politics. No. No, because I don't believe you work on the politics itself directly. I believe you work on the capacity of people to be more whole. Because I don't think they're, quote, sides that give us any help. It's like everything needs to be raised to level. So I don't jump into politics. Let's go right to the book itself. You sure. talk about disruptive innovation and the regenerative mindset. You know, I think of business and disruptive innovation are not the first two words that I think of. Um, 
Although, right, it, well, innovation is something that's really important. You would agree with that. Yes. Everyone thinks. And there is some kind of innovation that d doesn't necessarily provide leadership to an industry or even leadership to your own people. In order to do that kind of leapfrog, you have to disrupt some of the things that currently exist. But there's one other word I put in front of that, which is what's really important, which is enlightened disruption and enlightened disruptive innovation. And the reason for that is that the nature of enlightened means I actually see the effects I'm gonna have. So often we do disruption, our business will disrupt an industry and then many people are laid off, the whole thing falls apart. I mean, we're, we're watching that with energy industry right now and questions, but if you ask and you learn to be a systemic um, a thinker about the effects of various things as they're happening, then you are gonna get innovation that's good for the company and it's good for the system, including democracy. Can disruption happen inside a hierarchy? Uh, well, yeah, because disruption isn't always a good thing. I mean, hierarchies, if you're talking about you know, layers of management, uh, the major way we companies do that right now is they bring in an outside CEO and they say, turn this thing around or take it in a new direction. So that's the first one. There's a second way that people go after disruption fairly or, uh, regularly, which is restructure the organization, different people reporting to different people and moving a bunch of people around. That will disrupt the, the stability of the functioning of the company, certainly of people being able to work together. Uh, and it's done because they find things getting stale and unfortunately they don't know another way. The idea of trying to restructure usually is disruptive in a way that's not good for the business. Mm. So what is the regenerative mindset? What If, if I'm a, a mm -hmm. young CEO or a, a young person who's just gotten uh, his degree to where he wants to go out and, he, and he's got a good job, yeah. and the company comes to him and says, we want you to make a difference in our company. If he has or she has the regenerative mindset, what does that person have? So there are two sides of this question. There is the person, the way you're asking it, but there's also the way people structure work and whether that person could even work in that organization. Okay. So there are kind of three worldviews that really determine what regeneration means. The, the first one is much more uh, fixed mindset. Um, I see myself as fixed, I see you as fixed, the world is fixed, we can't change much, you were born this way, we get to take you however you are. Uh, so that's pretty limiting. The second mindset um, was created by Carol Dweck at Stanford and she calls it the growth mindset. And the growth says, oh wait, people can learn, let's give them opportunities, let's give them things they can take on they don't know how to do, let's give them training, education, and we actually believe people can grow. The difference in what a regenerative mindset is, it's what I call developmental, which is different than growth. And development means deveil, to remove the veil from a being or a product. And that means to take it again to its essence, to take it to its core, to take it to the DNA of a person, of a raw material you're working with. And you see everything is not just growing, because growing often I see happen with the worldview that people do with growth, mm -hmm. is they have competencies and sets of things that everybody should grow toward. All of that's a part of going past fixed, but it has nothing to do with unique individuals. So if this young person that you're talking about shows up and is being interviewed and they say I want a regenerative mindset then what they should be thinking they're saying to him is I want you to bring forward the most amazing part of you uniquely the essence you have into our company and help us be able to contribute to make a difference because of what you can do and they want everyone else doing that but there's one caveat in the context of the strategy of what the business is doing otherwise We've got, what do they mm -hmm. say, the inmates running the asylum? Yeah. So we're not everybody for himself, it's but everybody contributes something unique to the where the business is going. A lot of companies are run by the iron-fisted CEO because mm -hmm. that's the way that he learned right. and his grandfather learned right. and et cetera, et cetera. And so he's gonna keep it that way. Would not a regenerative mindset be something that the CEO couldn't deal with? Mindset literally is the way my mind sees the world, right? And um, I would say that uh, the majority of businesses cannot do what I'm talking about right now because they have command and control folks mm -hmm. who are stuck in a very old paradigm, an Aristotelian paradigm, you know, kings and queens and I am the king of the mm -hmm. organization. Uh, or a machine kind of thinking, you're the machine, you know, and I'm the king. And so you get things, 
in a way that nothing can move or change. So it, this, this is not work that calls itself out to the command and control, but I find the way I work with people is I find individuals who are attracted to this work. So a president of a business unit, or in many cases a smaller business, it, it's actually one of the battles the millennials are fighting right now. They have a growth and developmental mindset, and people try and interview them from a fixed mindset, and they try and get their um, recommendations from somebody who says they do what they're told, they follow you know the rules. Mm -hmm. That is back to the fixed mindset and the command and control in you or in the whole organization does not work. Hmm. You know, I'm glad you mentioned millennials because that's, yeah. that's something that uh, I think actually you really kind of talked about in the parable about growing people regeneratively, mm -hmm. yeah. even though that wasn't specifically about business. No, in fact, I decided to, so that I could make it really self-evident to tell the story of a, I, I ran a program for a criminal justice program out of Clark County in southern Washington, and it was for the parents uh, who had been delinquent and had been in jail and were not doing well going back and working with their, their children. Mm -hmm. And so I brought this idea in of these three different views and I started with them looking at and tell the story about a, a couple of young people uh, and a young mom even, who the idea was she, she kept wanting her daughter to behave and her daughter had a tendency to tell little fibs as young kids do and then they got bigger fibs and then she got as she got a little older she kept telling her mom off. Well that's a very fixed mindset. You have a way you're supposed to behave. And then we played a little bit with, well, what interests her? You know, what is she fascinated by? And the, the in-between kind of work that we did on that was, how would you have you two do something together? And they did cook together, and that cooking gave them an opportunity to engage more. It wasn't about her behaving, but the real thing was to find out what this young child, she was at that age, 12 years old, uh, what did she get really excited about? And we dis uh, discovered in a pr uh, process of just watching her how she loved theater. She loved, and she wrote plays, even at this age. I mean, they were little mini plays, but they were out of her own agony. And she had been going through things that were, you know, doing harm to her own body. And the minute she was able to express different characters and that she could tell the story of what had gone on, her friends started joining her. And we created a little developmental theater acting group. And I went back to that that town about 15 years later and I found her directing children's theater. Oh, no she doubt. had found her essence, right? She'd yeah. found who she was and she'd gone to this more developmental uh, worldview which let her be a regenerative practitioner. So what I'm hearing you say then is from a business management standpoint is that instead of pushing the no button on employees yeah. over and over and over, you should find the yes. And there's a specific way I recommend doing that. Is um, that in the evolution of work design? One of the three approaches that we have to talk about is human growth. Is it there? It's there. Okay. Yeah. Now the. Uh, all right. Should we talk about that and Let's then I'll answer it. the question. Um, what is drives me crazy about the people who are trying to get rid of hierarchies is they are missing these kind of three core characteristics, which I believe in a lot of research shows is just innate to human happiness, human health, human productivity and creativity. And the first one is internal locus of control. That's a psychological term. If you go, I took, mm -hmm. you know, I studied psychology. It means I take full responsibility, whether it's good or bad, no matter how it plays out, I say, yep, I was there in the middle of it, I don't blame anybody. Uh, and I'm willing to say, and I contributed, I was a part of that and I'm very proud of that. The second thing that you have to have with it though, uh, because you can become very arrogant saying, you know, I can handle anything. The second half I say is external considering. <clears throat> That's a philosophical term. And it means I think about others. I pay attention to the effects what I'm gonna do has. I ask what the outcomes are for more than me. And as a result of that, I am much more considerate. That's therefore external considering. Now you put those two together. Think about a person with, who takes accountability for themselves, but they also think about other people. You've created a whole more whole human being because mm -hmm. we also know some people get so into external considering, all they think about are other people. And they don't actually build some things unique for them in the world. And I say that third thing that comes into play if they can get both of those is personal agency. Then I can take on things that need to be taken on that if I don't take them on, they may not get done and I just feel like I have to go do it. That's really empowering the employee. Are it, companies ready to do that? I call it enabling. Uh, and I know that word has got a little contamination on it, but empowering means turn them loose. This mm -hmm. means I say you have to build capability and I've built 
40 companies in the last 20 years that are like this. So mm -hmm. not every company in the world is like that. But what I, the only ones that come talk to me <laughs> are the ones that are ready. Who's ready? Well, we're doing a lot of this at Google. I've had parts of businesses in DuPont. Uh, I did a major set of transformations with Colgate Palmolive in Europe and South Africa. Uh, there are a lot of small businesses which what, you wouldn't know the name of. When I, when I say who's ready, the way I, what I really yeah. mean is how do you know that they're ready and how does that company know that they're ready? I think that the best way I can answer that is I don't determine that, like, but I can go in and have a conversation and often it comes from watching a show like this and people say, wow, that's so much different. I want to know more about that and we have a, a kind of an assessment conversation or they read a book that I've written or someone else. I don't think there are a lot of people working this way yet but I think there are people who are looking for it. I feel like it's my job to get the word out so that they can find it. Uh, and then what I do is go play with people in a conversation and they decide, yeah, I think let's try that. And most of the places I go come by referral. So that's how they find it. Someone has made an amazing difference and they tell them, here's what we did. There is a business guru from Stanford, and we've talked about him before. I won't say his name, but there is a business guru from Stanford who talks about how you have to make sure that you've hired the right employee. Yeah. If you hired the wrong employee, then the best thing you can do for that employee is to let them go uh, right. to go up to other pursuits. What I'm hearing you say is that you should do everything you can to develop the people that you have. Actually, that's exactly what I'm saying. I say build, don't buy. Because people pay a fortune buying people, trying to retain them, trying to keep them happy. And instead, you can build 100% of the people in your company to become higher talent than you could pay for. And I can tell you that because in Kingsford Charcoal, they make dirty charcoal, right, that mm -hmm. was full of people, many of whom had never graduated from high school. As we worked and built capability across that system with eighth grade education to some high school graduates, we suddenly had people who became for Clorox people they promoted over time. They solved problems in the communities. They took on many things that the communities couldn't take on, became mayors. And all of it was was a combination of opportunity and capability building and then turning them loose to work on the business. And we grew it to, you know, 70% market share and more than tripled the margins because it was a low margin business and made a steady revenue stream. So you can do it for the business and all of those people, it transformed their lives and they quit hiring people. In fact, they started sharing their people instead of trying to hire people in. So as you develop people to have more capability, instead of leaving the company, they're loyal to the company, right? Oh my gosh, that is one of the core things that keep, pe people stay with a business because they get an opportunity to grow every day, they get an opportunity to contribute, and they get to be a part of a team which they feel like everybody's in it together. Uh, so that's, all of those things have to be there too. But yeah, the turnover rate, if you've got an industry that's high turnover rate, nope, time to slow down. One of my favorite sections in the book was eliminating 30 toxic business practices. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, we don't have time for 30, yeah. but well, let's do three. So even worse, I have 100. Oh, no. I have 103, <laughs> actually. But you know, when you write a book, you have to pick some. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and then we do a show. We have to pick. Some we have to two, pick a few, right? I'm only going to pick three. Sorry. Yeah, one of them is rating and ranking. You're talking about yeah. rating and ranking employees. Yeah, how is that a bad? So, thing? so um, first you have to understand the paradigm it comes from. Remember, we want internal looks of control, external considering, and personal agency. Okay. And if we don't have those, we don't have a company that has earnings, margins, and cash flow like we want, and we don't have democracy. So, we have to start with that. The problem with um, the kind of things that are about it, reward and recognition and incentives is they undermine internal locus of control because someone else decides what you get rewarded for. So I say to people, instead of trying to figure out how to reward and recognize people, get them asking how are they doing, how do they improve, because the, other th the worst part, the reason it becomes toxic, is the rewards pick out somebody because you have to give the annual award or the employee of the month or the employee of the year. And all the other employees, and I've done so much research on this, done the surveys and found that, people all say, but I covered for them. I did all these other things while they were out there. Why are they getting recognized? Or worse, people steal ideas and don't give full credit. So you undermine an organization with all that you stuff. You know, there's people all around the world who just started nodding their heads yeah. in agreement with what you exactly. just Exactly. One of the other uh, elimination uh, practices, toxic business practices that should be done is performance review. Right, and it's and, the same and, thing. And I just, I just remember being in a performance review in a company one time and I thought it was <laughs> just absurd. It is. 
Now, the question is why? And I've, sent, I've done papers on this, so if anybody wants to send me a, an email at carol at carolsanford.com, I'll send you the particular papers on why these don't work. But performance reviews have several problems. It is um, they undermine our ability to help a person be self-reflective. To ask people to begin to watch themselves is what we want. We no longer believe people can. We believe we have to have external kind of stuff. That's a very old paradigm that's inaccurate. Mm -hmm. What mostly happens is when is they're against some set of competencies which are generic that don't acknowledge who you are as an individual and you get rated, checked off the list, and you get more lower high scores and what you're doing is working some some generic idea but the worst part of it is most of it and psychology today just wrote a big piece about this recently on feedback and the kind of which the performance review is and it is really projection. It usually belongs to the person who is giving it to someone else. So if I tell you, you've got a problem with being kind and sweet or whatever it is, it usually is me that has that problem. You know, Jack Welch, when he was at yeah. GE, this was one of his big deals is we do the performance reviews and we get rid of 20% of the employees. I know. Year. See, that's the that's the fixed mindset. We got bad people, we got to sort through them, get rid of them, give them feedback, and if they don't work, we throw them out. So that was my first mindset, right? Mm. Fixed. And if you're there and you're in the aristocracy kind of paradigm, then you get Jack Welch's of the world and all the people he trained who are out there in the world running around. Well, but then you have Marissa Mayer, who when she was a Yahoo, she did exactly the same thing. Right. So yeah. I don't think what she did worked either. It, I, it hasn't. So <laughs> no, right. Uh, so I am not in favor of that. I'm in favor. I The kind of businesses I work with become non-displaceable in their business. They aren't up and down GE struggling right now. A lot of it are from these old paradigms. So the recognition is okay if there is a recognition that is available for everybody, but not necessarily. I don't even believe you want the company. See, we're still got external. So we've got now external, internal locus of control. I mean, external locus of control and internal consent. We've flipped it. Mm -hmm. So I get companies to give money to teams. So let's just say it's a, a IT team, and all of those teams, when they accomplish something, they throw a party they recognize themselves and they set out in advance what they're going to achieve and then everyone gets to come hear their story and it's then the next team gets to do it i don't ever ever want some committee or some hierarchy of person deciding who gets recognized what the review is i want it coming out of the individuals out of the team now we've got internal locus of control when we build the party we've got external considering and we are advocating and moving and building more personal agency. What I'm hearing you talk about with re the regenerative mindset and, and uh, against recognition and all of those things seems to be completely opposite yep. of the IT company mindset which is always looking for a ubiquitous solution. Yeah, it's not just IT. Uh, the idea of generic anything is, of course, if you just think about that, you want, why would you want anything generic? How can a company be unique if it does? And the idea of best practices drives me crazy because it's genericizing and commodifying a company in terms of all of its practices. What you want is a company that designs its strategy, figures out who its markets are, what the essence of each of those customers are, and you design for them. Then you design work practices. This book is much more about how you design work to tie it to the strategy, how you tie it to the uniqueness of customers, how you tie it to your own essence, therefore you can regenerate it. So it's it's true that it's not you know terribly embraced right now because most people are still in the fixed mindset. They're mm -hmm. creeping, creeping into the growth one and believe we could get generic ideas for how humans should be. Uh, I don't think in my lifetime we're going to get all the way there. <laughs> can a company afford to not be generic? Oh, what do you mean? That's like death to their bottom line. Because the thing that makes people buy products, I mean, there have been so many books and so much research, it's the distinctiveness of you. I mean, if you look at the big companies that do really well, we think they're the only ones who can do it. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be generic. You want to be you. You want to be your DNA. And n learning how to figure out what that is, is a, what every company has to do to stand out. Otherwise, you have low margin. You have a low margin business. You're a commodity, right? So, no, we, I mean, of course we can stand to do without that. Companies are, uh, for the most part, they, are, they take on the personality of the CEO or the people in the C-suite. Yeah. Um, how do you get to be a CEO with the regenerative mindset? So I, went, I worked with Chad Holliday, Chairman, CEO, and President of DuPont, who's now Chairman of Shell. And when he became in those three roles, 
Instead of taking on his personality, he said, let's go do the essence of the company. So we went back to E.I. DuPont. We went to the founding of the company and found that E.I. DuPont, who had been on the final, the last king's staff while they were trying to wipe out the plebes, he, he instead said, I think that we need to build safe, uh, and he was handling dynamite and uh, things for the king. He fled and he created a safe system to manage risk for very high volatiles. So if you think about that, it, that's really unique. And mm -hmm. DuPont, it, under Chad's leadership, went to really learning how to manage risk and they wouldn't take on a product they unless they could figure out how to manage it safely. Now, that's gotten a little lost with the people who came after him. But we designed everything that was going to happen everywhere based on that core message of how do I do my work? How do I do this product we make? How do we create this service? All based on managing risk, which is the essence of the company. So that's what you want, not the personality of the people. Let's talk about the five phases. We only yeah. have time for maybe two. Yeah. You talk about evolving a, a company into a courageous culture. Yeah. What's, what's courage here? And define that. So courage for me is the ability to take on what I call promises beyond ableness. Promises beyond ableness are not promises without ableness, but they're things that company individuals and teams commit to do for a customer, earth, community, investors, one of the stakeholders. And it's something they don't know how to do, but they know that they can learn, they want to, they feel called to do it, and they make a promise to do that. Now we structure work so that that happens for everybody in a company. When you make promises to something outside, you've just evoked external considering, mm -hmm. you have evoked internal control because I'm going to figure out how to do this. And now you have to exercise the personal agency because it ain't going to happen easily. Many of these promises that people make happen over years, some over months. Uh, some of them are with particular buyer classes within the company. That is a very courageous way to operate. And you have to have a company which is willing to make promises so big that people have space within the company to do that. And then you do a lot of reflecting on how the culture needs to change and work on building different cultural guidelines. We got about a minute left and I got yeah. an hour's worth of questions left, but instead I'm just gonna ask it with the one question that you ask out of the book. Which of these ideas scare the hell out of you? At my age, I'm not afraid of much anymore. I, what's really true for me is I'm afraid people won't take this on that they will keep following something that's so predictable and stay asleep. I s always say, if I died tomorrow, I've had the most extraordinary life. I have affected thousands of people around the planet. And I did it knowing that many times I was likely to be fired and have been. Not, I've never been internal to a company, but fired because it scared people. So I think what scares me is that people operate too much out of fear and they do not challenge themselves to be ready to be developed and be regenerative in how they think. Well, Carol, I'm absolutely certain that you have inspired everyone who has watched this show. Thank you very much. You're for being so welcome, Stan. Good to see you.